In the first part, we spoke about the front lateral diffuser. That is, how does the front floor of the RB19 in itself works like a front lateral diffuser using the front strakes, the front keel curvature, and also the front kick, which is quite innovative to the RB19. In this video, we're going to talk about the rear floor of the RB19. We're going to talk about the rear diffuser and how that works in ways which is not very intuitive at the very beginning. So in this video, let's dive into the aero mechanisms of the second lateral diffuser. Let's dive into it then. So to begin the video, let us first look at how diffusers generally work and how F1 diffusers work in general. And then let us dive into some of the details of the RB19 rear floor and diffuser. Most motorsport fans understand how diffusers work in general. They are open venturi systems that result in the drop of static pressure at the throat before the diffuser starts expanding. The higher the expansion, the higher the drop in static pressure. However, open venturi systems don't work like the conventional ones. These are dominated and primarily supported by Vortex structures. I've left a link in the description that explains how the diffusers work in detail. Coming back to maximize and support the flow expansion within a limited design space, F1 engineers use Vortex structures to maximize flow expansion. However, the larger the expansion, the higher the adverse pressure gradient that the Vortex needs to travel through and vortices do not like adverse pressure gradients. They become lossy or in the worst case burst as they travel through the diffuser in the adverse pressure gradients, especially as the ride height changes. There are some very interesting details when we zoom into the RB19 rear floor. We see a double kick line which is marked in red on the picture in the right. What they might be doing with this is they might be distributing loading of the diffuser using this configuration to reduce losses and ensure that it works across a larger ride height conditions instead of having one kick which takes all the loading and thus can be sometimes in some conditions lossy. Additionally, what you can also notice is the flow expansion happening in conjunction with the keel at the front of the green line which is marked. And this works really with the kick and the expansion theory to generate additional load. And lastly, there is that really aggressive flick at the end of the diffuser, which might be the secret to the whole DRS stall theory with a single element beam wing that has been floating around and I've also done a video on. But overall, it's a very exciting floor and lots of mechanisms to unpack. Now that we've discussed how the floor looks like, let us talk about some of the potential error mechanisms at play to make sure that the floor works consistently across all the right height conditions. The first mechanism at play is the relative position of the tire circulation. The rotating tire of an F1 car majorly creates two counter rotating pair of vortex structures behind it. These vortex structures transition in strength, position and inwash outwash pattern as they travel downstream towards the rear tire. Of particular interest to us is the lower vortex close to the ground. The images are X slices that travel downstream the length of the car as you can see on the right and it shows the transition of how this vortex goes as it travels the length of the car. As you can notice, initially the vortex is counter rotating and feeds off the outwash that is created by the front floor along the front floor edge as we discussed in part one. However, as the vortex travels downstream due to the combined effect of the stagnation pressure from the rear tire and the image system effect of vortices near a wall, this vortex starts in washing as you can see in the image on the right and thus land up feeding airflow into the floor as the vortex moves away from the floor. Added to this is the natural tendency of airflow to seep into the floor around the floor edges due to the pressure difference in the upper and the lower surface of the floor. Both these combined effects act as the inlet for the second lateral diffuser. Now that we figured out an additional inlet into our diffuser other than the flow coming from the floor itself, let us look at how this additional inwash is used 
to make sure that the vortex structures that travel through the diffuser have enough strength and are also maintained in terms of their health and cleanliness so that they don't burst or don't become lossy into the diffuser. The flowage wing that you see in the top image is an interesting device that has multiple functions. Going back to our discussion on vortices and how they need support in adverse pressure gradients that they face as the diffuser expands, the question arises, how can we support them? Well, one solution is to add vorticity to the vortex system itself. However, this vorticity addition has to happen at the right moment. Think of this as you are climbing a hill and having a small energy drink, pun intended. If you drink it at the beginning, it's not that effective and drinking it too late is also useless. You want to have it at the right moment to maximize its benefits so that you can climb the hill in the fastest possible way. And that is exactly the situation the vortex finds itself in. What's the best moment to inject vorticity into a system? Well, that depends on what teams are seeing in their high fidelity CFD with respect to vortex health and breakdown. But one thing is for sure, they need this boost to maximize the performance from the diffuser. The flowage wing creates an additional shedding edge, which is in close proximity to the primary floor vortex structure, as you can see in the image at the bottom. And such additional features allows an F1 team to optimize the injection of vorticity at just the right time as per their CFD simulations to obtain the maximum diffuser expansion. The flowage wing also preserves the planform area used to generate downforce while changing the shedding edge position itself. This is why this design is smarter than simply regressing the flowage inwards as we go rearwards, as this would result in a loss of planform area itself. Additionally, shedding the flowage vorticity early on helps to offload the vortex structure that is shed from the diffuser sidewall, which is in close proximity to the rear tire contact patch. Depending on your aero philosophy, this might be a good or a bad thing, but at least the floor edge wing provides a control parameter to this effect. What effect does the diffuser sidewall vortex have? Well, to begin with, this vortex builds up in an adverse pressure gradient, so it's not the cleanest. In addition to that, it sits low down in washing all the tire squish into the diffuser, which is never a good idea. So there is a merit to trying to offload this vortex structure. Summing up, the flowage wing design plays an integral part in ensuring vorticity is added to the second lateral diffuser in the correct manner, such that it allows teams to push their rear flow design and diffuser design to consistently generate high downforce across a larger range of ride height conditions. Up next, let us look at the reinforcing mechanism at play that is used by the F1 teams in the form of a mouse hole to ensure that downforce is produced across a larger range of ride height conditions. When Red Bull started performing their flowways on the side pods, one thing was clear, they were really focusing on delivering high energy air to the rear of the car via the G-line, that is the transition region between the chassis and the floor. Further examination of the flowies pictures showed that they were doing this by feeding airflow into the diffuser via a cutout present on the diffuser sidewall, which is now commonly referred to as a mouse hole. Aerodynamically, to ensure that the diffuser works for a large range of ride height condition, vortex health is the most important factor. Vortex health, as we discussed in part 1, depends on a factor known as swirl, which is the ratio of tangential velocity and the axial velocity of the vortex. As you can see from the image below, without the mouse hole, the diffuser vortices tend to undergo axial vortex breakdown. More about them in the description below. So how does the mouse hole help you with varying ride height? Well, when the rear ride height is high as the vortex travels through a higher adverse pressure gradient inside the diffuser, it starts losing its axial velocity, thus changing the swirl parameter, putting it out of its ideal working range, initiating an axial vortex breakdown. When the rear ride height is lower, the tangential velocity of the vortex increases. Again, changing the swirl parameter and putting it outside its ideal working window, initiating a vortex breakdown. 
The mouse hole therefore basically helps to feed axial velocity to the vortex inside the diffuser so that it can work under a wide range of ride height condition and maximize the diffuser lateral expansion by maintaining the swirl parameter in its ideal working range. Well, those were some of the interesting error mechanisms I felt I should share with you guys. Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below and feel free to ask questions. I try to answer most of them. If you love this kind of content, feel free to like and subscribe. You are watching F1 Aeronamicist.